Good. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I can. I hope you can uh, hear me all right and see the slides. Um, actually, um, I'm going to assume that's OK unless somebody tells me otherwise. So uh, this uh, is lovely to be with you. And I'm sorry I can't be with you in person. I omitted to say this morning, we've got about three inches of snow here. Um, and uh, it's been a very uh, threatening all afternoon. So <laughs> we decided that discretion might be the better part. But hope to be with you again soon. Now, this is uh, an intriguing subject. And we know from the Bible that God is at work in our world. And what we want to do this afternoon is just look at a few passages which demonstrate quite how involved the angels are in doing God's work in our world. And in fact, how that has an implication for us too. In fact, we want to consider this under five headings. And the first of these is to think about the fact that angels are strong and powerful and they are his spirit army in heaven. Well, the first reference that we have to this is actually in Psalm 103. So let's just start there together as we read that passage together. Psalm 103, a wonderful, reassuring psalm that reminds us of God's character and his love and his care for us. At verse 20 of that psalm, Psalm 103, verse 20, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. So we notice here they excel in strength. This is how they're described, these great and mighty, powerful beings who do his will. If you just keep a, well, say keep a finger, you hardly have to, to turn over the page to Psalm 104 and verse 4 tells us a little bit more that God makes his angels spirits his ministers a flaming fire so they are spirit beings they're not like us in the way the bible describes us as being flesh and blood they are like him spirit beings but they do his will and they excel in strength and they are greater than human humanity in that respect and not only so but daniel chapter 4 tells us plainly that god does according to his will in the army of heaven and there's quite a thought there is an unseen army accomplishing god's will all of the rest of life goes on on the earth entirely oblivious to the fact that god is at work indeed again we read in daniel chapter 4 that god and his will is being done in the kingdom of men. And just occasionally there are glimpses of this in the scriptural record. That occasion when Hezekiah being faced by an invading army was delivered. One angel got sorted out 185,000 Assyrian soldiers and saved the city of Jerusalem from what appeared to be near and total destruction. So God can accomplish a great deal through these armies. Now, what I want to do in these five examples that we're taking on five aspects is compare how there might be a link to us. And it might at first sight appear difficult to see a connection because for this first attribute, because, of course, the whole point here is that these angels are spirit beings in whom God accomplishes his will. And because they are so much greater than us, they excel in wisdom and strength. How could we in any sense be associated with them? Well, consider this wonderful verse that we find in Isaiah chapter 40. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. This wonderful verse points to the opportunity and the hope for those who fear God. He's speaking of a time in which frail, weak, mortal human beings can attain unto the same nature that the Lord Jesus now has, that he shares and has been given from his Father, and that he shares with the angels. And the future promise is that those who wait upon the Lord now, those who trust him and seek to do his will, will in that day renew their strength. And there is a need 
for mortal, frail human beings to renew our strength, not just every morning, but rather in the beauties of immortality itself, a renewal into that which is without limit. See how beautifully he describes it. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, the effortless flight of one of God's greatest creatures. There's another passage where he compares it to, I think it's in the same passage where he compares it to young men who even they, when they run, grow weary, but not so the immortal. They run and not weary. They walk and not faint. And in that day, by God's grace, we might be able to serve him without limit, just as the angels do in this current time. So there's the first aspect of these five, that the angels are strong and powerful, God's spirit army in heaven. Well, what about our second? Angels do God's commands, listening to his voice, obeying him, doing what he delights in, and acting in accordance with his written word. Well, the first point to compare there to look at is we've already seen actually in that same verse, Psalm 103, verse 20, just to go back there. We were focusing on the first part of the verse, those angels that excel in strength. But the second says, that do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. So these angels, which are so powerful, are not just doing whatever they feel like. They are doing God's commands. They obey him. Although in actual fact, of course, there are passages which indicate that they are indeed using the intelligence that they've been given to work out how to accomplish his purpose. Nonetheless, they are doing his will exactly as he requests. Verse 21. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. So the angels do what delights God. And it's a thought-provoking contrast that sometimes we do what delights us, not what delights God. Not so the angels always do what delights him. It is their delight to do what delights him. I mentioned the written word, though. What about this? Well, I wouldn't want to push this point too far, but it's a very thought-provoking passage. Revelation chapter 22. We've already seen it in the previous passage saying that this one, uh, I'm turning up actually. The previous verse uh, mentioned that actually uh, they hearken to his word. Revelation 22 verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen... I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. So John is confronted by the angel who showed him all the wonderful things in the book of Revelation. In fact, it's, we learn from the opening chapter that Jesus says, I've sent mine angel. And John now has been given all these, all these pictures and visions and information in the book of Revelation. And now when he comes to this point, he's so in awe of what has been shown that he's about to fall down and worship the angel. And the angel says, it's not about me. This is God's word. And, but he says very significantly, I am part of that group of those, said verse 9, who keep the sayings of this book. Of thy brethren, the prophets, thy fellow servant, and the, the saying, those who keep the sayings of this book. So it's at least possible that certainly the angel is grouping himself with those who fear God. And there is a mention there of keeping the sayings of the book. And I suppose there's a fairly obvious lesson for us in that if that's what the angels are doing, well, then we should be too. But that's not all. Angels obey the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. Consider what we find in this passage, Matthew chapter 8. This is one of the occasions when the Lord Jesus Christ conducted an amazing parable and uh, I'm so sorry, uh, undertook an amazing miracle of healing. And uh, in Matthew chapter eight, verse five, just tells us of, of the occasion. 
When Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. So this very important soldier, indeed captain of soldiers, a large number of soldiers, had one who was very ill. Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. And that's not without significance, the Lord Jesus Christ making as a Jew being prepared to go into a Gentile home and to heal such a man. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. So there was a centurion stuck at home. There was the Lord Jesus Christ being asked to go and heal him, and him saying, and, and the centurion saying, I'm not worthy that you come, but all you have to do is say the word and he would be healed. Verse nine says, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Now, there was something about the response of the man that really impressed Jesus. You notice he, he marvels, he's amazed, and he says he hasn't found faith like that, no, not in Israel. Well, of course, as we say, he's speaking to a Gentile, to a non-Jewish person, and therefore even the Jews who might have revered the Jewish scriptures, which Jesus was always talking about, not so this man. He was, in fact, uh, not, not of his origin anyway, he was a centurion. So what was it about the response of this soldier of captain of soldiers that produced such a response from Jesus? One of the other gospels, I think it's in Luke, where we read in verse nine, I am a man under authority, records it as I also am a man under authority. And that lends another aspect to it completely. Look again at what the centurion actually says. I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. Of course, the centurion would have to look up to Caesar as his authority. He took his orders from Caesar, and he had other soldiers under him took their orders from him. And he says, I also am in that position, which, of course, implied that Jesus was a man under authority having others under him. And so it was indeed the case. The Lord Jesus Christ was under the authority of God himself. Even at the end of the thousand year kingdom in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Jesus gives back the kingdom to God, acknowledging him as the supreme authority. All the way through his ministry, Jesus was at pains to point out that the words that he spoke, and the actions that he took were not his, they came from God. And so he was indeed a man under authority, but he also had others under him. The angels did the bidding and the command of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say to this man, go and he goeth, and to another come and he cometh. And this man knew that when the Lord spoke, the angels would, with fleetness of foot, go to heal his servant. And so it proved. Because when the man got home, verse 13, Jesus said to the centurion, go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. But there's more than that, because when it comes to the approach and the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ in obeying his father, there's also an attribute and an aspect of that that applies to us. We've seen that angels obey the Lord Jesus Christ. Just consider this verse in Hebrews chapter 5. Though he, Jesus, were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So the Lord Jesus Christ learned obedience by the things he suffered. We read elsewhere that he suffered being tempted, didn't learn by his mistakes as we so often do, 
but rather by the process of having to apply his mind to God's principles and choose the right way always so that he would be sinless in love and obedience to his father. And he is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. And you see the point that we're being drawn to consider here. Just as Jesus obeyed his father and the angels obey him, so we are called on to obey him and his commands as we find them in the pages of scripture. So angels, strong and powerful, obey God's voice, obey Jesus' direction. And what's more, they are sent forth as messengers to serve the heirs of salvation. Well, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 tells us that quite plainly. There we can read that the angels are sent to those who will be heirs of salvation. We were thinking earlier about uh, those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ as being heirs of that great inheritance, the promise that he's given to those who fear him. So in Hebrews chapter 1, and I'm just referring to it rather than turning it up, it does say there that they are his ministers, his servants, just as we saw in Psalm 103. Where I do want to go, though, is to Daniel chapter 6, just as an interesting example of how God is serving his people. Now, of course, there are many examples of where God delivers his people through the work of the angels from very difficult trying and circumstances and perhaps even death itself. But there's no guarantee that God will always do that. In fact, in all the pages of scripture, that might be argued to be the exception rather than the rule. God has certainly never promised that those who fear him will be excused any kind of difficulty, but rather that the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ might know that anything that does happen is because he has allowed it, which isn't always what we might most like, but to at least know that he is working with us according to his wisdom. And he is a loving father, as we saw in the Psalm 103. Well, here's uh, the three friends of Daniel in Daniel chapter 3, and they certainly are in trouble in verse 20, because here they're about to be thrown into a burning fiery furnace. They've obeyed, obeyed God by not bowing down to the big image in Daniel chapter 3. Verse 20, he commanded the king did, Nebuchadnezzar, he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then those men were bound in their coats, their hosen and their hats and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men fell down bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Well, that was their predicament. And we know from the context that actually God sent his angel. Uh, verse 25, when the king looked into the furnace, he saw four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God or, or the son of the gods. And possibly he saw an angel that just was evidence that God had sent his angel to deliver his servants. In fact, verse 28 actually says that. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Behold the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. So God can, should he choose, to deliver his servants. And the principle that we find with these three and also with the apostles in the book of Acts is that they are to fearlessly say that they will do God's will regardless of what he does, whether he choose to deliver them or not. He is able, should he so choose. And ultimately, we have the assurance that he will deliver his people even into his kingdom. So how does that relate to us? What's the aspect of the angels as messengers to serve the heirs of salvation. How does that in any sense relate to us? Well, we remember that the angels are messengers. That's uh, the root meaning of the word. And there is an aspect that applies to us today, even so, if we're seeking to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. On one occasion, 
somebody said to him, when Jesus said, follow me, somebody said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And I, I don't think perhaps it was the case where it was the funeral just about to happen, but rather he was saying, well, let, let, let a few, few years go on. And when things have settled down, then, then I'll come and follow you. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. You see, it was really about priorities. Let me first do this. Let me attend to things here and now in my life and my concerns now. And then when I'm ready, I'll come and follow you. And Jesus said, no, the focus is God. What you've got to do is go and tell others about the wonder of the message. And insofar as there is a parallel, it is that we might do God's will by seeking to share that message of hope with others. Because otherwise we're in a world without that hope. So angels are described as being servants to the heirs of salvation. And he's inviting us to join our work with theirs in preaching that message to, to others who might also be, that they might also be heirs of salvation. Well, here's our final aspect. Angels are in control of our world, but not the next. Well, there's really a key verse here to look at, and it's in Hebrews again. It's Hebrews chapter 2. Now, we're coming in the middle of a quite a, a, a developed argument here, and I'm not going to concern ourselves with the immediate context in this particular case, but just to focus on Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Well, the world to come is the world of the kingdom. It's the time when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth, when God's will is done through the whole earth. But there's an interesting implication in that verse. It says, the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. And the thing is that the angels are in control of our world, doing the will of God. That the angels, as we've already seen from the psalm at the beginning and in those other places, are not just doing whatever they want to do. They want to do, they are doing God's will. But in the kingdom age, the world is not under their direct rulership. In fact, the whole point of the context of, of Hebrews chapter 2 is that in that future age of the kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be ruling with his people, the people referred to as the saints, the holy ones. They are the people who in Daniel chapter 7 take the kingdom and they rule for God. They carry out his will in obeying the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the angels, well, it's almost as though the, just as the angels now rule the world invisibly, in that day the world will be under the supervision of the saints and the angels will be doing their bidding. It's one step removed. In those days, we read that the disciples, the 12 disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And the other parts of the earth will be under the control of the people of the Lord Jesus Christ, making sure that his will is done in all the earth. If we would read of it in Revelation 20, we, we read of Satan being bound a thousand years, uh, the serpent being bound. And that's really talking about human government and rule being brought to subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ through the work of God's law spreading through the whole earth. So the whole point of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5 is that whereas the world now is under the subjection of the angels, under their rule, in that time to come, those who fear God will be helping to carry out his will and making sure that it spreads across the earth. Here's that verse in Daniel chapter 7 that I just referred to a moment ago. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High and all dominion shall serve and obey him. It's not 
explicitly not because the people of the saints of the most high have anything in it for their own glory that's really not the issue the whole point is it is for god's glory and that those who attain to that time to do his will are in their lives shown humility to him to do his will so there's our five aspects that the angels are strong and powerful, God's spirit army in heaven. They obey God's voice. They obey the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are servants to the heirs of salvation. They're in control of our world in doing God's will, but not the world of the kingdom. And so the question for us each, there are those senses we've considered and perhaps others in which we might be challenged to consider as they do God's will now for each of us to think well am I when I read God's word and consider what he wants me to do whether I am freely choosing to do it with all the benefits and blessings that God has promised just before I finish I just bring to your attention this website which just brings to brings to life actually five ideas about the benefits and the meaning of following the Lord Jesus Christ now. These facts are not so much the facts of prophecy or that demonstrate that the Bible is true or any of the other reasons that we might consider, but rather, once we believe that the Bible is true, what is the meaning and the consequence for our lives? And one of those is in fact about the work of the angels with us. So that might, be, might potentially be of interest. Thank you for your time this afternoon.